Welcome to the Strategic Marketer Podcast, where we talk about strategies, tactics, and practical steps to help you become a more strategic marketer. I'm your host, Joseph Lewin, and today I'm speaking with Dave Polis. Dave is the Chief Consultant at Granite Partners. In our conversation today, we're talking about customer research. We're going to cover how to identify your ideal customers, how to go about doing customer interviews and and finding the right information so that you can really speak to your specific audience and move the needle much faster. So without further ado, let's dive in. A lot of people talk about understanding their ideal customers, and some people say it's really important. Some people say it's not that important. Um, so in your, in your opinion and, and from your experience, is understanding your ideal customers important? As a marketer, I can't understand too much about my customer. It's absolutely critical that I know exactly what it is that customer wants, needs, feels, hates, pain points, preferences, lifestyles as much data as I can possibly jam into my files about that customer, the better I'm going to be at reaching them and resonating with my messaging with them at the right place at the right time with the right attitude and the right approach. So for my success, I need to know as much about that customer as possible. And I don't see another way around it because it's really a very simple formula. You ask people what it is they want. They tell you what it is they want, and then you give it to them. It's really pretty simple, but you'd be amazed how many companies say they know their customers and they really don't because, and I've gone into meetings with CEOs that swore up and down. They knew their company. They knew their customers. They knew their members absolutely inside and out. And I lay a saw buck on the desk and I say, I'll bet you (laughs) this, that at the end of the week, I will be able to prove you wrong. I'm going to give you 10 questions and you fill them out based on what you know about your customers. And then I'll go do my research and I'll come back and I'll show them the answers the customers actually gave me and when they pick their jaw back up off the desk, they hand me the saw buck and away we go. <laughs> yes. It's just it. <laughs> people don't know nearly as much as they think they do. They suppose a lot and they guess a lot and they assume a lot. But really, really knowing that customer, absolutely critical to the foundation of any really good customer centric marketing program. Absolutely. Yeah. And I um, I find that it, it is those assumptions a lot of times. It's that people have an idea of what they want their customers to like, or they have an idea, you know, they've already created features. There's some of that investment bias where they've already invested a lot into certain projects or pet projects or different ideas or logos or colors or whatever it would be. They've invested in those things. And so then they're assuming that their customers like it. Or I think another big one, especially for founder CEOs would be that they think that they're their target target audience when they aren't. Um, And I think one reason for that could be they started out as being their own target audience. Like they, they were the audience originally, but they're not anymore. And it's been so long since they were, you know, say that they're, they were an engineer and then they started a company consulting to engineers and now they've grown this big company. Well, maybe they haven't been an engineer for 20 years. So making that assumption that they're their own customer seems to be a, a pretty common pitfall. Founders are, are often guilty of this because they have separated themselves from the actual audience. But on top of that, very seldom, unless you're selling entrepreneurship courses, is a founder going to understand what the buyer really wants because they've never really had the same mindset. They've had the, some, the mindset that this is something they like, this is something they're good at, this is something they do, and therefore they're going to turn it into a business for others that may be of similar mind. Well, if the others were of similar mind, they'd have started the company and they'd have done this stuff. And they're not. (laughs) So they want to be sold to, but they want to be sold what they want, not what you want to sell them. And I think getting outside of their own head for founders is one of the toughest things out there. The transition from possibly salesman to founder to turning around and selling back to the customer that you used to be is a very distinct and, and very common road that a lot of people have trouble navigating. Yeah, no, oh, that's excellent. I totally, I'm totally on board with you for that. So, what are going to be some pitfalls then of not understanding your customer? What What are some of the challenges of that marketers run into when they don't really understand their customers? Well, there's quite a few. You mentioned one that uh, if you're using your customer profile, which you should have, and or several if you have them segmented, which you should. You're going to go down a rabbit hole on things like features and. It, interaction and your user 
interface and all kinds of things that you think you know, you're basing decisions all the way along based upon those assumptions. And if those assumptions are wrong, you're going down the wrong path. You're going down the wrong direction. And if you go too far with it, because after all, you've been this far, why turn back now? It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse. And you're getting further and further away from where you really need to be. So not only do you have to know the customer now, you need to set up feedback loops in place so that you continually learn more and more about the customer as the product evolves, as the service evolves, as your company evolves, so the two of you grow up together. That's one pitfall is that you go down a rabbit hole and you develop things that other people don't want. Hmm. Two, the main premise of who you're selling to may be off. And I've seen this happen time and again. You think you know what you're actually selling, but maybe your users are only using a third of what it is you're offering. Mm. So you've over-engineered for the, for the usage that people actually expect from you because you're only, you, you've missed the, the, the target audience. You're on the periphery of the real user. The real users may be 15 degrees to the left when you hit the middle of the target, and they would use all of it. But the, the customers you've snagged because of your, your assumptions, you've shifted to the right just a little bit, and you're catching the outer side of the ring where they're only using about a third of the power of the software or a third of the services you offer, or they're only using parts of the product you put together because they're not quite the right customer for you. That's two. Interesting. So yeah, you you could kind of take that two ways, and then I'll, I'll let you keep keep going, but you could take that two ways. You could either use that information once you figure that out to either realize, wow, we're, we're attracting the wrong customers that are only using 30% and we've developed this awesome tool and we, we need to find other ways to get in front of the correct audience would be one approach to that. Or the other approach would say be to say, maybe we're way overcharging to add all these extra features that nobody's going to end up wanting to use anyway. So now let's tailor it to this completely different audience that we didn't know originally, and then maybe add some extra features that they're actually interested in. And in a way, you can incorporate both of those ideas. You simply segment the offering. You have the basic offering, which is the 30% your current customers use. You put two more tiers above it with the other 60% in each one to get the customers that you really wanted. And then you shift your focus mm. back to get those. So now you've got an array of customers, the 30, the 60, and the 90 percenters, and you can market to them differently based upon what their actual usage is, what their needs are, and you capture a broader range of the audience without having to change or rebrand. You simply segment the product. It's, it's a very nice yeah, excellent. way to pivot just slightly and catch a much larger swath of the people you really want to serve. Okay, so I interrupted. You said two things, and then it sounded like you were going to keep oh, going. Uh, there's always more that you can that you can meet as challenges <laughs> in terms of, of what happens if you miss. Um, not only are you missing a good segment of the audience you should have, but you're probably going to experience much higher churn because the, the audience you have found is not quite correct. And if you don't adjust to that, like we were talking about before with changing the product or segmenting it out or approaching another segment of it, you're going to end up with those people being dissatisfied, disappointed. They're not really getting what they wanted, especially when they're paying full price. And they're going to back off and they're going to go find somewhere else. They're going to compare you, use you as the baseline to go shopping, which is exactly mm -hmm. what you don't want. Longevity and consistency are what you want. So you want to make sure that you're keeping customers and getting repeat customers and getting referrals to other customers from people who are happy with you. If you're only buying, if you're only eating a third of the loaf of bread, you're not going to go out and tell people to buy six loaves of wonder. You're, you're going to find out, okay, I only need a third of this. I'm going to go find some wheat bread down the road. So it's right. really a matter of not only finding the right ones, but keeping the right ones because they are the right ones. Yeah. And I think um, what I've seen with the importance of understanding your customers is to be able to find those people to begin with. So, you know, it's been more focused on the messaging side of it. And, you know, in my experience, it's been working with companies that are very sales based, you know, either they're an individual and they've just kind of taken whatever's come in, or it's a company that's been very heavy on the sales side and they've kind of just taken whatever and the sales guys are on commission. So they're going to say, yes, we can customize anything. Yeah, we can do that for sure. And you just get this huge array of different customers that have completely different wants, desires, they're using your product different and everything's so customized that when you come in as a marketer, you're like, well, who's your audience? And then it's like, oh, all of these different segments and all of these people, and you can't really scale that level of customization. And so you kind of have to step back and go, okay, well, who who are the best customers? Who are the ones that are paying us most, that don't churn, that aren't, that are paying on time, you know, and figure some of those things out and then start to put some of those pieces together so that you could start to define that. Because otherwise, 
how do you go find more people like those ideal customers? And if you just took the random array of customers that have all had these customized solutions and you try to go to market to all of them, I mean, you, you just, you can't do that. You're getting <laughs> it's, false data. It's not really possible. If, if you're trusting your data that is buried inside the house that exceptions built, um, you're going to have a very hard time pinpointing exactly who those real good customers are. Uh, the sales department needs to be aligned. If they are aligned properly and giving you good information and good feedback, they are your best friends. If they are not aligned and they're having to do so much more work to customize people and shoehorn the wrong customers into your offering, uh, they can be your deadliest enemy because they're not only giving you feedback that's inappropriate, but they're not happy doing their job either. And they're having to work three times as hard to close the wrong customer. It's much more difficult yeah. to do this if those two aren't working in lockstep and didn't have the same origination point. You got to be on the same page when you start this. Guys, this is the customer we're looking at. Ask them five or six mm -hmm. qualifying questions. If the answer to any of them is no, not a good customer for us. Move on. So, and that's very hard to do, especially when you're high commission salespeople. They are trying to stuff that pocket as fast as they possibly can and get on. And you're just going to end up with unhappy customers in churn because you're right. You can't scale that level of customization for anyone. Um, and if you build yeah. those exceptions and the implementation in, team is your the database one. is going to be full of trash because you're not going to be able to do a good, clean run of what the customer looks like. They're going to be all over the map. Absolutely. Yeah. And the implementation team, the people that are actually responsible for keeping everything going with the customers that already Swap. exist. Are going to hate sales and marketing. <laughs> if, they won't have time to breathe. If they, They're too busy catching up on, on all the band aids and, and uh, workarounds that they've built in to make these custom pieces for these people that weren't really good customers to start with. It's very labor consuming. Yeah. It's very time consuming. It's not very profitable. Let's look at the big picture for a minute. If you're spending most of your time trying to shoehorn the wrong customer into the right uh, opening, then you're not being very efficient. And we know efficiency and profitability correlate very highly. So what you want to do is make sure that you're working as smart as you can and that your salespeople are providing you with good data and you're providing them with good support in terms of who they really should be going after. And you're filling that pipeline with the appropriate people for them to look at. And the two of you are working together in harmony and in lockstep. Yes, it's going to be very efficient and therefore very profitable. Closing will be easier. Customers will stay longer um, and they'll come back and they'll tell two friends, which is really the idea. This week's episode of The Strategic Marketer is brought to you by the Brand Compass course. If you're looking to take your marketing services side hustle to the next level, the Brand Compass course is for you. In the course, you're going to learn how to identify your ideal customers and narrow down to serve a niche market. Then you're gonna learn how to productize your offering so that it's easier for customers to understand exactly what you do for them. And then you're gonna put all of this information into a one page messaging guide. That way you can use your customer's language to speak exactly to their pain points and problems every single time. Check out the show notes for a link to the course. Absolutely, and I know people say word of mouth marketing can't scale, but I think that's only true with businesses that don't nail some of these fundamentals that you're talking about. If you really understand your customer and you're, you've created a customized solution for that exact segment like that, you're providing something for that segment that nobody else is providing it quite in the same way because you really understand them, then of course they're going to recommend you because y y you've really nailed it on the, you, you've really hit the nail on the head for them. And there's nobody else that was able to do it quite like you could. So then of course they're going to share it. And I mean, I've, I've done that as somebody who's been a vendor and purchased. I have companies that I work with extremely reluctantly because, you know, either we've already worked with them in the past or there wasn't anybody that really stuck out from the crowd. And so you just kind of have to pick one of the okay options that are out there. But I've definitely worked with a few companies where they blown me away with the specificity that they had for exactly what I needed. And I've shared about them endlessly without them even asking for it. I mean, I've gone out of my way even before purchasing with them to share about them with other people because, because they nailed it on, on their offer and, you know, filling a need that people actually want by understanding their audience. Part of this is about the blue ocean strategy. If you do this well enough, you're going to the part of the ocean where there is no competition because you're it. You've become the de facto standard for this because you've nailed it so close to the bone 
and exactly what those people want. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to get people that only want 60% or 80% or whatever, but you don't need them because your core is covered. They're satisfied and you've hit that and you're right. They're going to share about that because they have no frame of reference. So if you're nailing, if they got no need to go shopping, that's the point. You want to keep them because there is no alternative because you're so close to what they need. And if you, as long as you maintain Absolutely. service levels and maintain support of the product, they're going to keep coming back because there's no reason to go anywhere. And they're going to tell two friends. Absolutely. It will scale. It scales exponentially among the audience that's correct. Now, yeah, that doesn't mean everybody suddenly becomes a customer because you've got a good base under you. That's a poor assumption as well. Oh, these guys like it. Therefore, everybody should like it. We'll blast huge amounts of money at advertising and drive everybody through this funnel and see what happens now that we've got it nailed. Big mistake. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that the Blue Ocean strategy, that's honestly probably one of my favorite marketing books just because it's its so brilliant, especially for small companies where it, the bigger companies are going after everyone because they're big enough to be able to have all these different segments. But if instead of you trying to be you know, say you run a video production company and you're trying to do video production for anybody that's going to come through your door. I mean, good luck. You can't you're, staff up. You're going to be competing on price. You can't up. You can't do anything adequately for any one customer because you're trying to be too many things to too many people. Yeah. I mean, there's no, no specialization there. But if that video production company focuses, and actually just today um, wrote a post about, th about this exact topic, but if you're a video production company and you focus on uh, on manufacturing SaaS startups and you help them create YouTube channels that uh, increase qualified leads, it's so much easier to get business that way than it is to just be a video production company that works with anybody. Right. You've now cut the audience by nine tenths by disqualifying most of the, the walk-ins. But here's the thing. Now you're staffed up for the folks that you want. You're geared up for the folks you want. You've got all the software and the people in place to make those things go smoothly and efficiently and profitably. And now you know what to charge because nobody else is serving that market. And now you can charge whatever yeah. you want and you'll get it. Because oh, yeah. Wait, you can charge way more because <laughs> you're selling a solution. Then at that point, sure. you're now you're now not just selling. They, yeah, they don't have a frame of reference. You're you're making it apples versus oranges. Like, sure, you go. Go ahead. Go find another pro video production company. You can't compare what we're doing because we're literally not doing the same thing. Sure, we're both making videos, but we're making videos specifically for the exact thing that you need, nobody else is going to be able to do yeah, that. They're going to have so, to flutz around and find different things and try and cobble together some sort of a system to do it more than once. And they're not going to be happy with that. And it's not going to be cheap and it's not going to be profitable. So you may as well not bother. Absolutely. So what role does data play in finding and uncovering your ideal audience, your ideal Well, customer? there's a couple of things about data. Um, in general, the place to start with most of this stuff is your own database. If you've built one correctly, that actually gives you the information and you filled it up with accurate information. The, the saying garbage in, garbage out has never been more true than it is today. In the era of big data, we're like trying to drink from a fire hose at this point. There's so much data out there. The question is, what are you trying to look for? What are you trying to measure? And what are you using the data for? So where do you go for this thing? Your own CRM system is the place to start if you've built it correctly to gather the kind of information you need to make decisions with. If you haven't, hmm. well, yeah, you can do a zip run and see where everybody lives. You probably got that information for 90% of your customers or better. Um, you, can, you can do phone overlays. You can do a whole bunch of things to enhance the data you have. But if what's in there already is wrong or it's not parsed correctly or it's not adequate or it's not filled up, You've got null sets all over the place for certain pieces of data. Your reports you pull are going to be useless, yeah. and it's not going to tell you anything about the actual customer. It's going to tell you about this big sort of basket of, of snakes that you put together that, that says very little in the long run that you can't use reliably to make decisions with. So start there. Clean up your own, your own data that you know is at least those customers are already in hand. That's a good way to figure out what you have already. Now, the question is, how do you go about Absolutely. enhancing that? so that you can go find more of the right one. And it, it becomes a, a series of yes, no questions. It's a cavalcade that starts uh, at the very beginning of your, your data quest when you set the thing up. What does my customer look like? What do they feel like? What do they read? What do they drive? What do they wear? How much do they make? Where do they live? All those questions need to be codified and, and sunk into your database design so that you're able to conjure up, say, a report of how many people do I have in Ohio that drive Hondas that that you know, travel more than 200 miles a day. 
Those are good questions right. to be able to ask, to be able to fill in those gaps in your customer profile. You should be able to envision what your customer looks like, their face, their hair, their clothes, their money, everything from data you pull out of your database for the ideal customer. And that's very difficult to do, but once you do it, now it's your best friend because now you can make decisions that are accurate and extendable and predictable in future. Absolutely. Yeah, and one thing that you're touching on there with having that level of detail, um, when you have that level of detail and it's built from actual customer data, that seems like that's pretty valuable because I keep hearing pushback from marketers about personas and being upset about all these fluffy little details in there because, you know, a bunch of people sat down in a room and like had a powwow and envisioned what their customer looks like. And they're like, I think they have two dogs and I, I think they like yoga. And, you know, then you, you come up with this customer work. profile and, build it and it's do just it. total. <laughs> you got it. You got to have actual data. And that's fine. If you can't conjure that stuff up on your customers, your your local data vendor is probably your best friend at this point because they have all this stuff captured. They have social media bots that are crawling. They have credit card data. They have insurance data. They have all manner of overlays that you can purchase for what to me seems like an incredible bargain to overlay your existing customer files and flesh them out to the point where you really can make some good decisions with it because you know, A, it's recent, B, it's accurate, C, it's more plentiful. So you're going to get enough overlap to create those pockets. Yeah, most of them have two dogs and drive a Buick, but some of them have one dog and drive a Volkswagen. Okay, now you've got two customer right. segments that may not need a slight tweak in messaging, but at least you know how to think about them a little differently. Absolutely. No, that's great. So what is, um, with that level of detail, because I'm just going to, I'm just going to push a little bit further on that because the the one thing I've heard is like, who who cares what car they're driving or you know, if they have two dogs or, you know, some of that, you know, more, um, fringe information, depending on, I mean, obviously if if you're a dog food company, (laughs) you probably do care about how many dogs they have, you know, that's pretty pertinent, but what is that level of detail going, going to do for you? And, you know, what are, what are you going to use some of that information? It may seem esoteric. It may seem extraneous to have some of that stuff in hand. Hey, you're not going to use it all at once. You're going to have to go back and do adjustments you're going to take a different slice of data. You're going to take a different question, a different query that's mm. going to yield another piece of data that you throw into your profile and tweak it slightly and shift its approach. What it helps you with is things like media selection, messaging, um, design approach even. If you've got people that vastly drive very you know small and expensive foreign cars, you're not going to use Rolls Royce in your imagery because it's going to right. it's going to ring hollow. You're not the right guy. But if you've got a bunch of guys that that are you know Porsche enthusiasts, sure, go ahead and throw one of those into your ad and watch them you know, perk right up because hey, this is for me. Um, it, you can Absolutely. do that. You can if you're going to run you know ads for a trash hauling company. You know NPR may not be their place to be. <laughs> Chances are those guys aren't right. listening. Um, you've got to match. All those little demographic data points allow you to match up with your medium's demographic audience reach. They allow you to match up your messaging approach to the right level. They allow you to find uh, the right voice for your brand for that particular customer. Uh, They allow you to pick the right TV stations, the right television programs, the right cable systems, Mm -hmm. the right social media channels. All that stuff is dictated by those little bitty bits of data. And you don't use any single one particularly in, in isolation. Use them in aggregate so that you're, you've got broad swaths of the right customer with shades of nuance for each one. Yeah. Yeah, and that makes even more sense when we're talking about finding the right target audience for an ad campaign. So, I mean, it can be helpful, like you're saying, for creating the content, which is usually more of the spot that I'm in and more of the people I'm interacting with are on that content creation side. And it does make sense there because, like you're saying, if you're able to have an image with somebody in a... Honda Civic with the dog hanging out the window and, you know, most of your people are in that relative zone, then it's going to perform better than if they're driving a, a Mercedes convertible, you know, and have a a cat you know, in, the, in the side of their car or whatever. Just it, those little details make a difference for imagery and, and even choosing your colors and um, all of that. But, but when it goes even further is for is for ad buying and, and purchasing and targeting that right audience. Cause in some platforms you can really narrow it down significantly 
down to like my minute details. Absolutely. Like and they're all categorized. You can pick your audience out of the list of demographic profiles they've built for their station and match the two up very nicely. But think about what that level of detail does to your SEO. I mean, think how closely you're going to be able to pick those key searches that they're going to be using to look for you on the internet in a way that you know is from their voice because you know them that well. They would ask the query this way. They would not use this big word to find us. They would use these two little words to find us because 80% of them are high schoolers, not college or vice versa. Yeah. You can you can really adjust your pitch and your, your verbiage to match the level of sophistication of the audience and hit far more home runs with, with the drive into the funnel at the top end because you've resonated exactly with the right level of sophistication for the audience. They don't think you're above them. They don't think you're below them. The idea is to be one of them. Strategic Marketer is brought to you in part by Thrive Themes. Thrive Themes is a killer visual WordPress editor. They've also recently launched editable themes so that you can edit every element of your WordPress theme. You can create amazing landing pages that are beautiful and conversion focused. They've built all of their products around helping you convert more leads into customers. You can find out more about Thrive Themes by clicking the link in the show notes. Yeah, so let's take that uh, a step further. So you you talked about starting with your own data. So let's go back to that for a second. What are some data points that are going to be the most important high high level data points that people are capturing in CRM that you you found a lot of people are are not capturing either aren't capturing at all or are not capturing correctly that everybody should be doing. Most people start off with the basics. If if you've got a good foundation, you have things like age, income, um, uh, education levels, job priorities, and, and titles. Job titles can be very nebulous because n- most industries don't really align them very well with other industries. So you really now have to be industry mm-hmm. specific if you're using that. If you're a B2B sales, that's going to mean an awful lot more than if you're B2C. You don't care what this guy does during the day. You want to know what he does on weekends. So filling yeah. in the hobbies section or filling in the lifestyles section, filling in those little bits of detail If 90% of your audience plays golf, you're going to want to know that, but you're not going to know that if you don't have those those sections of your database filled in adequately or accurately or consistently. And you've got to have pull-down menus for all this stuff because otherwise you're chasing your tail. One guy says golf, one guy says foursomes, one guy says this and that. The terminology has got to line up correctly when you build your database. And any administrator that, that hasn't filled you in on this has been tearing their hair out trying to get people to phrase things the same way so that the searches work. So you've got to have all those other bits of data in there that you don't think are relevant. A, your salespeople are going to love you because now they've got all kinds of things to talk about with that prospect. Because if 90% of them play golf, chances are excellent. You open up the conversation with how was your weekend and they talk about, you know, how they hit and whether they broke 70, you're in. You've you've established rapport. It's a very good start to that kind of thing. But it also indicates a lot of other things. Uh, Hobbies can indicate income level to some degree. Hobbies can indicate sophistication level in terms of mechanical um, ingenuity or aptitude. They can indicate right. sophistication in terms of education. Uh, and I, I can't tell you how many you know high school dropouts play golf because there aren't any. They're just <laughs> you, you, you go to the next level with those things for some reason. It's just the way it works. There are always outliers, but it's so small that you wouldn't bother with it. But you know, guys that right. go out and do car shows every week. Awesome, awesome audience. You can know those guys really well. Lock into a couple of social media feeds for for car enthusiasts, and you'll find out exactly what it is their needs are, how they speak, how they talk to each other, what their shorthand is, what their vernacular is like, and start to pull those kinds of things in there and use those as your pull-down menu for your selections and for your CEO and your SEO and your copy. And everything all locks together nicely for the audience that you really want. Yeah. No, that's great. Okay, so let's then go go one step further on that. So um, if we're looking for practical steps for people who are wanting to define their ideal customer better, um, so I want you to take this from two angles. One is, okay, you work at a huge company and you have the decision-making power to really go for it. You know, what do you do to start defining your audience better? Um, you know, what steps would you take? And then number two, you're working for a smaller company where you don't have a ton of resources and you're going to have to be doing a lot more of the 
of that work and effort yourself. What are practical steps in those two scenarios? Okay, let's start with the big company. That's easy enough. Um, A, we talked about starting with your CRM. Do a deep dive into what you already know about the customers that you have. A, define whether they're all good customers or not. B, segment off the good ones and focus on the data from them. Okay, so you, you want sort of a scatter plot. You want to set up sort of a, a, a faux profile and, and see how close everybody gets to it. And the people in the two middle rings are the folks you want to focus on. The rest, don't even worry about. Um, so that's mm-hmm. one thing. You're in a big company. You, can, you find your database administrator. You take them to lunch and you go, this is what I want to do. And you have them pull the data for you that actually tell you what you want to know. Two, you find 15, 20, 30 of those good customers. You have all their information. Get a hold of them. Talk to them, Mm. interview them, either one-on-one for about an hour, on the phone, half an hour, whatever you can get out of them, do some research. But you got to do this correctly. You can't just have a conversation. It's got to be guided and it's got to be interrogatory to the point where you're getting good, solid, repeatable information. You want to ask the same questions of all those different people and make sure you have a way of recording the responses so you can go back and codify them. See where the commonalities are. If 80% of them say one thing, Gee, you're trying to hit the jackpot. That should go in the profile. If only 10% of Absolutely. them say one thing, eh, it may be outliers and it may not be efficient and it may not be practical to use that. But at least you know it. So interviews is key. Um, and three, do some survey work. Get, get some folks out there and get some quantitative numbers to, for you to take to your CEO mm-hmm. and say, look, this is what our profile looks like. And the data shows it. 75% of our customers drive a Buick. Okay, we, get, we know this now. So if we're going to sell to people that drive a Buick, what else do we know about people that drive Buicks? And then you go out and get your data overlays from car manufacturers and you find out what their customers look like that drive Buicks. And you lay that over your customers and suddenly you've got this beautiful profile of who these people really are from another source where you didn't have to beg, bug all your customers to fill in a hole in your database. Now, for the small folks. Wait, hold on. So before you move on, so with the interviews, uh, one thing that is that I found doing customer interviews exactly like that is that you end up finding words and phrases that are across 80% of the people that you interview. And I remember doing one customer interview in particular, and there was this one word, the word was camaraderie. It's kind of a weird word. Mm -hmm. You know, when I would, if I was to sit down and write copy for this particular uh, company that would not have made the list. (laughs) And, but Literally, I interviewed, I think, 10 people and seven or eight of them use the word camaraderie separately um, from totally different companies. And some of them from the same company use that exact word. So I'm like, this word (laughs) needs to be on the website. This word needs to be used somewhere because everybody's using it. And the funny thing was that was the one word that when I gave the the feedback um, to, to the people I was working with, they were like, oh yeah, we love it. But you know, this one word we're not going to use I'm like <laughs> getting ready to pull out my hair. <laughs> I'm like, are you serious? That was probably the, the, uh, best piece of information we got out of it. At everything. some point you can't fight city hall, but you're going to develop it, as long as you're consistent in the interviews. Now you don't have to ask the same questions in the same order, but you have to record the responses of the same questions to be able to match them up. We videotape when we do interviews professionally for people. Uh, we run them through a, a, a facility often or something like this and for remote stuff. And we record everything and we go back and we transcribe it. And you can lay the transcriptions one after the other for the responses for each one of these things and get exactly what you need out of it. There's no reason why you can't sit those responses side by side in a transcript and go, hey, look, here's all the same language we can lift nine time after time after time. They're saying basically the same thing. Now, let's use that information to build up our profile so that they relate to us the most closely as they can. Awesome. Yeah. So now let's talk about the practical steps for a smaller company that doesn't have the same level of resources. The little guys have to do more of the work by hand, so to speak. You can't delegate to that database administrator to go do your searches. Your CRM is probably not as powerful. Um, It probably doesn't have as much bandwidth. And you probably are going to be a little sickened when you go to could buy all those data overlays from the credit card company or the insurance company and find out that uh, 80% of your people aren't even on there. Um, so mm-hmm. there's other ways to skin that cat. You can do your survey work first. Surveys are very simple and easy. You can do them through social media. You can do them through SurveyMonkey or some other platform that you can use fairly cheaply and get out there and get to those customers that you feel are the closest to the target. You've done a little 
dive into your CRM, you found, you know, 15 or 20 customers that seem to hang really tightly together. They've been with you the longest, probably. Longevity is a good indicator of, of target width. If, if they're a lifetime customer and they've been with you five years or six years or eight years and have bought consistently over time during that time, chances are good you hit the target. So use those. Hmm. That's one key indicator is longevity. Um, that doesn't mean all the new customers are invalid. It just means they haven't had a chance yet. But you'll see when you pull two segments, the old customer versus the new ones, and compare their data, you can see if there's a shift because of something you've hmm. done. Because if those new customers aren't very, very similar to the long-term ones, something's wrong. I so go into a deep dive, figure out where you think your target customer might be, then go get a small slice of the overlays to fill in some of the gaps and start picking up the phone. Um, I've known CEOs to go down to the call center and sit there and listen to customer service calls for days and days at a time. This is an informal way of gathering data about what bothers people, what disturbs them, what they like about the product yeah. and don't like about the product or service. It's a really informal way to gather information without being intrusive on the customer. They don't even know you're there. Um, and in fact, uh, the CEO of Sprint was famous for this. If you wow. notice uh, in, in Sprint's advertising, they were clinging by their fingernails. They'd been bought. They, their customer base was lousy. Their position was last on the, on the cellular pole. Uh, they really had low bandwidth. They had all kinds of problems. But what they did have was good customer information because their CEO who took over shortly after the last purchase said, I got to find out who these people are and what their problems are. And he went down mm -hmm. to the call center and he sat there for days and days and listened to customer service calls and figured out since all the other providers were doing things like showing coverage maps and showing how, you know, what elements went into their contract and what kind of bonuses you got and this, that, and the other thing, he noticed three things. One, not one customer mentioned coverage or maps. Two, not one customer had anything good to say about long-term contracts. And three, not one of them used any of the features or bonuses that had been sold to them as part of a package somewhere. So he said, okay, we're going to change this up. A, went to his accounting department, said, what's it going to cost me to convert all these people from a yearly contract to an at-will? Um, two, do not put coverage maps in our advertising because... No one cares. They'll assume the coverage is good regardless. <laughs> Three, where do we need to go next to make sure that we keep the people we have and we don't turn this into a giant debacle of churn? Get rid of all the packages. Let them do a la carte, mm. pick out what they want, and the other departments will, will figure out how to make that work independently for everybody. They'll all fall into the same three buckets anyway by the time you're done, but by giving them those choices... People felt much more free to customize whatever it is they need. Long story short, you won't see maps in their ads. They won't talk about coverage. They won't talk about contracts. They won't talk about packages. They'll talk about service. They'll talk about price. And they'll talk about accuracy. Those are the three things their customers cared about based upon him sitting in that call center listening to people bitch about their contract and how do they get out of it. This thing can be very yeah, helpful. And I love that. I love that because... A lot of people these days are talking about story and the importance of story. And I, I do agree with that. I mean, you read anything about psychology and you're going to realize people are irrational and <laughs> telling them stories does help to move the needle for people. So I'm not saying, you know, stories are bad, but sometimes people try so hard to tell this elaborate story that they lose sight of what the customers actually care about. And doing something like that, where you make your product actually do what the customer wants, becomes the story. And your customers are then going to be telling the story about how they switched over to Sprint and they no longer have long-term contracts and they love it. And you know, they're going to start raving to other people and telling that story. And that is a more compelling story than, you know, some what Sprint is doing in the uh, in in their organizational giving. Like customers aren't going to care about that if your product falls right. short. Now, maybe if you have the best product on the market and you've already done all of these things, and then you're going to layer some other stories on top of that that you know are relevant to your target audience, that is, a you know, I, I could really see that being valuable. But if you haven't done these underlying market fundamentals and make sure your product's actually doing what the customer wants, that to me is a much better place to start than trying to create some elaborate purpose, cause, or belief that you're trying to get people to join into. Just give them, give them what they want, you know, and you, you can only learn that by talking with your customers and figuring that One out. One of the beautiful things about all of this is if you base 
all of your marketing decisions, your brand decisions, everything you do going forward on what it is your customers want, what that ideal customer looks like and is seeking, you'll notice a very strong shift in everything in that company to being customer centric. Now, a lot of people give lip service to customer centric and they brush it off on the customer service department, but it doesn't start there. It starts at the top. If you don't start caring about customers and knowing about customers and why they like and don't like what they do, you're sunk because nobody likes to be sold. They like to be provided for, and you can't do that unless you know what needs there are. So everything turns around and becomes customer centric when you start using this as a basis for not just marketing decisions, but business decisions. Absolutely. And I think that's one, one thing that's helpful about uh, having run a small agency before myself and, you know, you being in, in the entrepreneurial side of things, running business, it it helps you to have more of a perspective on that customer centric idea when working even, you know, because now I'm working on an internal marketing department and I feel like I have more customer centric perspective because I had to really care about what customers thought when I was running my own business. And if I didn't, I wouldn't have a business. But if you separate that far enough, you get into these theoretical marketing ideas that end up becoming very separated from this. And I think understanding who, who I think it's actually whom, <laughs> I always get confused there, but anyway, understanding your customer and what's important to them is absolutely vital. And if you can nail that, the rest of it becomes so, so much easier. Um, so yeah, Dave, thanks so much for coming on. What are some ways that people can find you and um, find out more about how you can help them identifying their ideal customers? I can be found at uh, themarketingdoc.com. Uh, they go on there, that they can get a copy of my book. They can set up an appointment with me there to have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultative conversation to help do some business analysis or provide them some ideas. Um, they can find me uh, through Amazon, through my book, and uh, Google me. You'll find me. I'm everywhere. Sounds good. Yeah. And we met through LinkedIn. So find Dave on LinkedIn too. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, Dave, for joining the, the podcast today. And I look forward to future conversations. Joseph, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me on the program. Thank you for listening to this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to The Strategic Marketer wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you could do me a personal favor and hit five stars on the rating, you don't have to leave a full review, just hit five stars. It would really help me out. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Strategic Marketer.